All right, so I'm super excited for this panel discussion on uh, unifying and more peaceful approaches to DEI work in the workplace. And um, I'm going to just do a quick intro for each of you. Very happy to have you. And then we can uh, dive in with my initial prompt for the conversation. And then we'll take it from there and let, let it unfold organically. So we're, we're uh, joined today by, first off, Dr. Sheena Mason. Uh, Dr. Mason earned her PhD in English literature with distinction in May 2021 from Howard University. She joined the faculty at SUNY Oneonta in Oneonta, New York in August 2021 as a tenure-track assistant professor in African-American literature. She's taught at the College of William and Mary, the California Lutheran University, and Howard University. Her book, titled Theory of Race Racelessness, A Case for Philosophies of Anti-Racism, was released by Powgrave and Macmillan in 2022. Additionally, she co-authored Harlem Renaissance and Interpretation of Racialized Art and Ethics, a chapter of the uh, forthcoming Oxford Handbook of Ethics and Art, examining what, if anything, is the proper role of race in the aesthetic productions of or about members of racialized populations. And you can learn more about her at theoryofracelessness.org. We're also joined by Dr. Carlos Hoyt, uh, Dr. Hoyt provides consultations and training on matters related to social identity, social bias, and social justice to a number of organizations, including independent and public schools, businesses, and a wide range of organizations. He's worked as an assistant professor of social work at Wheelock uh, College in Boston, Massachusetts, and has held teaching positions at Simmons College, Leslie University, and Boston University, providing instruction in clinical skills and practice group dynamics, multicultural assessment, and cultural competence. Carlos's first book, The Arc of a Bad Idea, Understanding and Transcending Race, was published in 2016, and he's published numerous works, presented a TEDx talk, and appeared on several podcasts. You can learn more about Carlos at carloshoyt.com. That's H-O-Y-T. And finally, our final panelist, Greg Thomas, is the CEO and co-founder of the Jazz Leadership Project, where he embodies the strategic vision of the company and enacts, it, uh, and enacts its it during live workshops and for the Tune In to Leadership blog. The co-creator of G&J Productions, Greg has been an instrumental in developing humanities programs for top cultural organizations such as Jazz at Lincoln Center. And as a journalist and scholar, he's conducted in-depth research and conducted hundreds of interviews over the course of his career. Greg has given presentations on jazz, culture, race, and democratic life and values for a range of platforms and institutions such as Columbia, Hamilton, and Harvard. Learn more at Jazz Leadership Project Dot com. Thank you so much, three of you, for, for being here. Uh, I am uh, Jeremy Pollack. Uh, my PhD is in social psychology, and my particular uh, research background is in social identity, so this is a near and dear uh, area to my heart. Um, I have a master's in anthropology and a master's in conflict resolution, um, and uh, I, I've been very interested in DEI work uh, from a number of, for a number of reasons, but I'm going to start out with a prompt here. Uh, I think someone raised their hand. I can't keep it at that for a second. Okay. I'm going to start out with a prompt here to lead off our conversation today. Uh, so according to multiple studies, typical DEI and anti-bias training has not proven effective and in some cases has proven deleterious to workplace culture, creating more conflict as a result. In my experience working with companies, several leaders of DEI initiatives have reported that team members have not been engaged in these initiatives and forcing them to become engaged actually led to conflicts. And after some investigation, it was revealed that a lot of people weren't convinced there was a problem requiring such initiatives or that the true problem wasn't identified or that, or that the solutions the company had proposed were unclear as to how they would adequately address the problem. And so ultimately these DEI initiatives led to greater division and conflict rather than unification, which is unfortunately, uh, which is unfortunate, you know, if we assume that team unity is one of the primary goals of DEI work, then it's uh, unfortunate that it actually led to the opposite. So my question has become, what are more strategic, unifying, and peace-centered approaches to DEI work in companies? And um, I am going to give each of you uh, a, a about a five minutes to uh, answer these three questions in an intro, and I'll give you the questions now. So when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, what is the typical problem or problems that we should be trying to solve from your perspective or framework? Number two, what do you believe is an appropriate solution or solutions to such a problem? And number three, why has your approach been effective in working towards the solution and ultimately potentially solving 
some of these problems. So I will, uh, if, uh, does anyone want to start by show of hand with those three? Should I pick? <laughs> I'm happy to defer to my colleagues. I'm happy to start. Um, Greg and Sheena, whatever you think would be best since we know each other in our work. <laughs> I'm think? fine with you starting, Carlos. Okay. All right. Thank you both. Um, and thank you, Jeremy. So I know you have us in a five minute frame. It might take like seven, uh, but I think uh, that's okay. Take uh, seven. Greg and Sheena will be okay with that because it goes into conversation. So I'm going to share some slides and I'm going to walk pretty briskly through them um, because then we'll have time to unpack them in conversation. So let's see if I can do this. Uh, share. And let's see. All right, can folks see my slides? Yes. Is that good? We can see this? Awesome. All right. So um, I, I put the, uh, the image that's up on, on your site, Jeremy, up here because I just love being in the company of, of, of Gina and Greg. So it's wonderful to be with the three of them to discuss this stuff. And thank you again for having us. Um, I added to the right, as you can see, just two things that I find myself saying a whole lot. Uh, diversity without divisiveness is possible and necessary in these fractious times, and inclusivity can and must be pursued inclusively. And you'll probably hear that again before I'm done with these five to seven minutes. Um, so uh, as a frame to this, I, I took to heart, Jeremy, your, your opening remarks about this. I'm not going to read them all here. Um, and I'm going to address the questions again pretty um, briskly. But I think the way we frame our conversations about DEI um, these days is very important to pay attention to. And I find that uh, the frame that you sort of put us in is reflected uh, as of the way we usually talk about it. Um, but it does sort of put a spotlight on what seems to be not working well um, in terms of DEI. Uh, these initiatives leads to greater divisions. Um, you know, uh, people don't necessarily see that there's a problem or agree on what the problem is. All of that is true, so I don't mean to deny that at all. But what I love about uh, your opening is that it ends with the question, what's a better way to do it? Because I think that's where our focus needs to be. And I think too often the discussion is, well, this thing we call DEI or SEL or whatever just isn't good. Um, because as I said in my opening, it's, it's necessary. So in terms of these questions, well, and again, in terms of the framing, one of the articles that I know you referenced in your uh, opening was from uh, the Harvard Business Review, and it was written in 2016. And that is where, you know, it was actually said, like, you know, your organization will become less diverse, not more, if you require managers to go to diversity training. And they just went chapter and verse about everything that can go wrong. But then they ended the article, and I think this is important by saying, the very good news is that we know what does work. We just need to do more of it. And I believe we need to talk more about <laughs> the stuff that does work. Interestingly, you know, from that article in uh, HBR in 2016, roughly a year later, they did another article, two types of diversity training that really do work. <laughs> and in that one, they actually talked about some approaches uh, that are working now. I point this out because this thing that we call DEI, although it's had many um, iterations uh, over the years, is pretty darn new. You know, diversity in this country became a thing. Um, well, way back, you know, when people were forced to come here uh, from a distant land, um, but it became what we think is a positive thing. You know, when um, in World War II, you know, the troops were being uh, diversified, when women went into the workplace, and all of that ushered into a, it ushered in a need to be able to manage what happens when people from different backgrounds get together. So it's a very nascent field of study. Um, and I like to help people to understand that. And if we're saying we're gonna evaluate it and scrutinize it, certainly we should, but it's also just getting its sides. So when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, what is a typical problem uh, that we should be trying to solve uh, from my perspective or framework? Uh, first, again, I want to note like the framing, you know, it's a little bit negative. It's a problem that we should be trying to solve. Uh, and certainly there are challenges that we should be taking on. But I'll share that when I think about DEI, it's pretty simple. DEI is about helping people to get along, <laughs> right? And there are lots of ways to do that. But when diversity is in the mix, then there needs to be a special way to sort of go at that. Uh, 
the rhyme and reason for DEI capacity building, I'm gonna take us very quickly through seven like dots that can be connected, I hope very clearly. So let me read this through for you. Uh, number one, diversity has been proven to enhance the richness of human interaction and lead to better outcomes, meaning ideas, performance, and products than non-diverse or homogeneous groupings. When people with different social identities get together, great things can happen. However, we are all both instinctually inclined and socially conditioned to varying degrees to be potentially interested in or wary of people we perceive to be different from us. That is unfamiliar in terms of ethnicity or heritage, appearance, age, ability, gender, sexual orientation, all the ways in which people have different social identities. When weariness is stronger or the stronger response to diversity than interest, people can tend to separate along lines of perceived commonality of social identity instead of interacting in ways that realize the positive potential of diversity. Therefore, creating generative and harmonious diverse communities requires that all members are treated equitably and inclusively. Equity simply means every person gets what they need, whether it be support, resources, attention, et cetera, to be able to experience equal levels of what their community has to offer, whether it be security, opportunity, health, et cetera. Inclusion simply means that every person feels they are welcome, that they belong, that they are respected, listened to, and cared for as much as everyone else in the community. We ought to pay attention to this, this thing we call DEI, and sometimes I refer to it as social identity, social bias, and social justice, and the way those things interact, because we understand three things. We all have many social identities as shown in a prism that I'll show you pretty soon. We are sometimes treated positively, that is advantaged or privileged, or negatively, disadvantaged or deprived, based on how others perceive us in terms of social identity, and because we wanna prevent social bias and foster social justice. If all those dots connect, then we know why DEI is done, and we know that we need to do it. What do I believe is an appropriate solution to this problem or this set of problems? This one's simple, and I'll flesh it out later. The two things that I said earlier, the way to approach the EI effectively, excuse me. Is to make sure that when we approach this thing we call diversity, we avoid it being divisive. And a lot of what does go wrong, you know, in some DEI practices is that it's divisive. And finally, when we approach inclusivity, although it makes sense to focus on certain strands of identity at certain times, we have to keep everybody in mind all the time. Inclusivity can and must be pursued inclusively. So why is my approach been effective in working towards the solution and ultimately solving the problem? And here I feel like, when I, I feel arrogant whenever I say this, but I'm lucky to have been doing this long enough to know what does work and that it does work. And there are two areas um, that I'll just highlight here and I'll stop because I know I'm on five or seven minutes or so. And then during conversation, I'll share some of the material that flushes this out. But there are two uh, major things that I, I think has made my approach work. One is that we begin with a common, clear, and connective framework. What do we mean when we mean DEI? How do we all think about it? What's the through line for us all? And then second, what's our common commitment regarding our attitude towards this work and our approach? Once those two things are laid down as foundations, then we can go on and do some wonderful work together. And the two examples of actual material that I use in my work um, that have proven to be uh, very effective are two things. One is called the social identity prism and the other is a DEI ally pact. So after I give Greg and Sheena a chance to um, sort of talk through their five to seven minutes of intro, I'll be happy to come back during our open conversation and sort of flesh some of these things out. But I'll stop sharing for now and not hog the stage anymore. Great. Thank you, Carlos. That was really, that was informative. Thank you. I'm excited to dive into it a little bit. Um, uh, you, does Sheena, do you want to go next? Yes, thank you. Um, one benefit of going after Carlos is then I can say I second everything that Carlos said. Um, in fact, we worked on that PowerPoint together. Uh, no. <laughs> we did not, but I think Part of what I want to emphasize from what Carlos said is, is the problem of framing um, and um, our tendency to not practice what we preach. So I hear a lot of people talking about the existence of diversity, the importance of diversity, but 
in practice, um, I find that many people treat differences or perceive differences as a negative. So one example I can give, right, in addition to doing work in DEI, I'm an assistant professor and, and my students are in one class in particular, are in the practice of comparing everything that happens in my class with them to all of their other experiences from other classes. And it's very clear to me that it's a negative comparison. Like because your class is different in these ways, because we're more discussion-based or because we don't have as much homework or because our readings are X, Y, and Z, there's this constant comparison and, and they've concluded even without necessarily articulating it that the differences equate to um, being bad, right? Um, and so, but then those same students will practice, will preach about the need for diversity, right? The importance and the the rich, the enriching nature of diversity. But then, when presented with actual differences in something simple like a classroom, um, they they translate differences, thereby diversity, into a negative. And it strikes me that that's the kind of mind, mindset or tendency that one of Carlos's slides was pointing to and talking about, such that when we go into spaces where we're intentional about doing diversity, equity, inclusion work, um, and especially something like anti-racism, which is my particular wheelhouse, the mindset of the instructors, the mindset of the participants, the mindset of the leader in the space can often be one that creates a culture of the differences between us that exist. If it, if, if it pertains to politics, right? If it pertains to how people want to see themselves or how I see other people, that those differences are there and I, I'm attaching a value, a good or bad value to these differences, which can then mean that there are immediately walls up, right? There are walls up between you and I because I see myself in this way or because you see myself in that way. And one of the reasons why my framework has helped people outside of that, not just as it pertains to um, racism and anti-racism, but as it pertains to all of the binary ways in which we um, tend to um, see ourselves in each other, the sort of us versus them mentality, is because a lot of the us versus them or the binary ways in which we see ourselves and each other is um, is a sort of black and white thinking, which I suspect that Carlos is going to delve into when he's talking about the prism that he intends to share. It's a sort of black and white thinking that encourages us and actually requires us to miss the grayness, the complexity, the nuance that that reality is. Um, and that black and white thinking is encouraged and upheld by the sort of labels that we attach to ourselves based on gender, sexuality, race. Um, and I think on a fundamental level, the DEI work, the sort of traditionally understood DEI work that's been practiced is operating with the sort of us versus them, black and white frameworks that, that we've all inherited, but then unintentionally upholding right, or underscoring the divisiveness that we then now perceive as happening today. Um, and we need frameworks, we need ways of, of recognizing how we label or categorize ourselves, how others categorize us. We need ways of recognizing these things and honoring and valuing and respecting how each of us sees ourselves, the labels we attach or don't attach, and really understanding on a deep level why um, in order to be able to move forward together. Um, but right at, as it stands, it strikes me that there's a general lack of understanding as to why people feel, <laughs> you know, that they want to see themselves in particular ways. And because I don't understand it's a bad thing or it's something I want to hold at arm's length or it's, it's something I don't even want to talk about. 
And the theory of racelessness helps people get outside of the black and white by focusing on the racialization aspect, but then it inevitably carries over into all of the other ways in which we see ourselves as diametrically opposed. Thank you. Lots there, Loved to, excited to dive into that as well. Thank you, Sheena. Um, Greg, and I'll, I'll just restate um, my three prompts again, just for anybody that's new, newly joined. Um, we're looking at, we're, we're trying to think about what is the kind of problem or challenge we're trying to solve with uh, DEI work or what's the sort of the goal of it? What is, what is the goal or solution that, we're look, that we think would solve that kind of challenge? And then uh, do you have a particular approach that you think is a, is a good approach to solving that challenge or meeting that solution? Okay, thank you so much. And, and thank you, Jeremy. Thank you to my colleagues, Carlos and, and Sheena. I'm very happy to join you here. Um, I wanna say, use an expression that is common in theater and comedy improvisation, yes and. And since I deal uh, in and with jazz, uh, yes and is, is fundamental in the sense of improvisation. So I agree with my colleagues and I want to add that the, we, come, we work with, with organizations, um, you know, in, in many cases, Fortune 50 organizations. And I wanna approach the problem from another angle, from the organizational angle. Um, oftentimes when DNI or DEI or JEDI programs are, are brought in, it is something that is siloed. It is something that is um, not seen as fundamental to the strategic and tactical objectives of the organization as a whole. And I've found that if these programs don't have a buy-in from the very top, that can be very problematic. It becomes siloed because something that we do to cover um, and, you know, to check off certain things on the checklist. Okay, we've done that. You know, we've, we've covered some of our uh, EEOC requirements and that type of thing. We've complied. Uh, I, I think that's a problem to be acknowledged also, in addition to the ones that, that Carlos and Sheena mentioned. In terms of solutions, um, I, in a general way, I would say that a better understanding of how we as human beings, how our cognition and our neurophysiology works, and also how culture works is fundamental. So there's an organization, the Neuro Leadership Institute, that does, I think, very good work in this space because they take in consideration how we are neurophysiologically in certain situations, in groups, uh, how identity relates to that. My own company's approach is called diversity, maturity, and inclusion. Um, and we call it that because we want it to not replace equity, because equity in terms of fairness, uh, equity in terms of, uh, in financial terms, being an asset is very important. Uh, and equity in terms of justice is also important. But by saying maturity, we want to bring more of a developmental approach to this. And by developmental, I mean that we see dealing with diversity and inclusion in a way where we have a tiered approach, starting with the identity or affirmative action approach where you know, we acknowledge the various identities that people have, and we don't bypass that. And I think another problem with some of the approaches to DNI and DEI is that it seems to me, based on what I've studied and what I've heard, that that layer is where it starts and, and stays oftentimes. Um, but what we do is we acknowledge that dimension, we acknowledge the importance of that, but then we go to the next phase, which is appreciating diversity and difference for its own sake. Um, that we have differences in our backgrounds, we have differences 
in our, you know, the regions we come from. We have differences in terms of our, our orientations. We have differences uh, by gender. We have differences by ethnicity. We have different styles of thought. And that piece, that word style, ties into a tool that we use. We use several assessment tools, and one of them uh, deals with operational style. <clears throat> so it actually it's a kind of a 2.0 beyond the characterological or personality driven approaches where it looks as how do people like to work together? And that is placed in a grid that shows how some people are more operationally focused, some people are more improver focused, quality control, some others are more design thinking, some others are more discovery um, driven uh, and, and visionary driven. And based on where you're placed in these, we see how certain team dynamics and organizational dynamics play out just from those, what we call operational DNA markers. So appreciating difference and diversity is, is another level. But then you have to realize as uh, R. Roosevelt Thomas, one of the pioneers in the industry, he had a book in 1991 called Beyond Race and Gender. And one of the things he talked about in his work, that and others, is that whenever you have diversity, whenever you have differences, that's going to bring a certain tension. So that tension needs to be managed. So we call that managing diversity tension, and there are various techniques for that. And the highest level, at least in our model, is leveraging diversity and inclusion where you take all of the things that came before, and as opposed to it being something that tears you down, you can actually leverage diversity and inclusion in a way that makes the individual stronger and acknowledged, the team stronger and acknowledged, and the organization stronger also. So I just wanted to give you a picture or a vision of our approach uh, in terms of solutions. And we found that it's effective because we incorporate music, we incorporate creativity and a cultural technology of jazz uh, to explain these models or these perspectives, to demonstrate it. And people end up having a lot of fun. It's experiential, it's interactive. And we find that people, uh, when they do it through music, that's a commonality that can share, whether they like jazz or not. Um, but music is a commonality that people can share. And then we can bring in these concepts and ideas in a way where people feel that there's a shared space of understanding um, that they can lean on as we go through these different phases of what we call diversity, maturity, and inclusion. I love that. The tiered approach, it makes so much sense to me because it really does speak to this idea of maturity. It's like a developmental approach to, uh, to, to approaching the situation. So. Um, I, let me see. I'm going to just connect connect a couple of, of some dots here. So, when, when you all speak, there there is a there's a general theme, and, and I agree, and it and it's clear in the in the research as well that there is a lot of benefit to taking people from diverse experiences, backgrounds, etc., diversity, and bringing them together in a cooperative way. It really does benefit the organization. Um, and then, and then for some reason, there's this, there's this level, I'm thinking about a couple of clients in particular, there's this sort of, um, there's a ceiling effect uh, in terms of motivation. I wanna, I wanna um, circle back to this idea of buy-in that you mentioned, Greg. One of the things, and this is kind of the reason I structured these questions this way, is one of the things that I've seen is like, you know, we, especially as like practitioners, we, can't, we know the benefits of having diverse diverse types of people with the diverse types of experiences, knowledge, backgrounds, et cetera, in an organization. But when, when organizations, sometimes when they do this kind of work, when they label it as DEI or however they label it and they do this work, they're, they're running again, up against the, the issue of buy-in, of people not being very engaged with it. And I, I, one in particular that I'm remembering, and she said to me, well, I don't understand why people aren't engaging. We're having these meetings or we're having these kind of activities and no one seems to be really talking too much and stuff. And I said, well, did you did you ask people, did you send out a survey? Did you do any kind of assessment ahead of time to determine 
what it is in this space that people feel is important? And, and the answer was no, because basically they were kind of just checking a box. This is what we're supposed to do. And um, and so and so the so so for me, like whenever we're trying to manage a change process, or we're trying, even if it's like a simple behavioral change across the board, or something that's like potentially really disruptive, somewhere on the spectrum of change, hey, we want to implement some knowledge, some change in some way, in some way. People have to be motivated because that's going to take effort. And so my, I guess my question is, is how do we get people motivated? How do we get people to buy into the idea that th th this idea of, of diversity and not just one type of diversity, but all different types of diversity is important, so important that it 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 justifies everyone putting an effort to bring in diverse people's perspectives, experiences, et cetera, and really communicate, cooperate, coordinate well with each other? How do we get people to buy into that or to motivate them? Carlos? Um, so I'm back on the screen, um, which means I can't see, but I can see my screen. But before I go any further, I wanna say thanks um, to all three of you, because this uh, is the way the work needs to be talked about <laughs> uh, and then also done because the spirit of this is just so constructive. You know, you stare down the problem, you admit it's there, but then you fix it. <laughs> you don't just throw everything out. Um, so the buy-in issue, to simplify, I think what causes problems is that folks walk into a frame, one that hasn't been generated by them. You're quite right about that, Jeremy. Uh, to give people a chance to say what would make this work for you <laughs> what are your pri uh, primary issues would be wonderful and it seems elementary but it isn't always done uh, and the other is that they quite rightly sense that there's something sort of blaming and shaming going on here you know that this is about you know identifying um who is a, a rightful victim and who is a wrongful victimizer and that stuff does happen <laughs> let's be clear about that but instead of focusing on when and how that happens, the people come into the room wondering which one of those categories they're in. So I left off by talking about, um, you know, a couple of examples of things that do work. So in terms of framework, I've been uh, developing and using this for quite a while now, and I'll say a little bit about it in a cursory way, but if uh, any of the three of you think I'm moving too fast, then slow me down and I'll go back to something. So this is called the social identity prism. Um, and you'll see here, there's a depiction of what I'd like to be a prism <laughs> over on the left side. I'm not the world's greatest artist. Uh, and the idea here is that just like a prism refracts the rays of, uh, of the spectrum of light, uh, our human brains you know, refract personhood. Um, and we tend to refract ourselves into you know, several primary categories of social identity. And you see them here coming out of the prism on the right. I'll refer to them as strands, even though I should refer to them as rays, and it's gonna be light, so forgive me for that. Uh, and they are uh, generally family, ethnicity, and heritage, physical appearance, age, ability, gender, sexual orientation, race or racialization, you'll hear me sometimes say, social status, worldview and belief system. And then I added this plus sign there in case I'm missing anything that's important to anybody else. And um, at that, level, you know, I hope we see that this aims to be inclusive of every single way that a human being can be. And we are those ways intersectionally, you know, we're never just one of these things. On the right side, you know, of that um, graphic is a simple, I hope, you know, explanation that our brains tend to sort, simplify and rank everything, including our personhood, this or that, good or bad, us or them. It's really hard for us to hold the multiple intersecting aspects of personhood all at once in our minds. Our brains weren't necessarily built for that, but we can do it with practice. Instead, like a prism, we often refract our complex whole selves into narrow categories. Now, good things can come out of that in terms of pride and association and solidarity, but obviously some negative things can come out of it too in terms of bias and bigotry, et cetera. When we recognize the full spectrum of social identity uh, and resist the tendency to reduce people to one or another restrictive category, then we have a capacity to think critically, inclusively, engage empathically, and reduce social bias and thrive in an increasingly complex and interconnected world. The reason that this works, and people tell me the reason that it works, is that it's not political, <laughs> it's not you know, activist in any sort of inflammatory way. Um, and it universalizes all of us. This is true for every single human being on the planet. 
the end product here is what you see down in the right. You know, that whoever you are, however you are, as long as you are not bringing bigotry to the game, then you are safe here. And then the rest of this are some handy dandy definitions of all the terms that are used there. And I put them on the graphic because very often when we're talking about issues related to uh, DEI, social identity, social bias, and social justice, we might be using the same word and not be meaning the same thing. Uh, so I really encourage folks to take a moment and make sure that we're defining our terms and that we're talking about the same thing. So that's a framework you know, that holds everyone uh, inside the work. The other thing I mentioned um, earlier is a common approach and commitment to the work. So there's what we're doing, and hopefully this represents and holds that properly. And then there's a the question of how we do it. And one of the things that's proved really effective as a tool for folks is what I call the DEI Ally Pact, the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Ally Pact. And this uh, is an attempt to get beyond uh, even the impression you know, of shame and blame, you know, and villains and victims. And instead, again, say that as human beings, especially, you know, dealing in a complicated and increasingly diverse world, we all are susceptible to these things. Therefore, wouldn't it be good to humbly commit to the things that are on this page and in this pack? And I'll read them through for you. I know I have blind spots. The inability to see what, that what I'm doing might be harmful to someone. I know I have tough spots the natural resistance to input that suggests my behavior conflicts with my intention. I know I have blank spots, a lack of data and knowledge about crucial differences in social advantages and disadvantages between myself and others. And I know I have work to do. I promise to do the work I need to do to see my biases, spare you my defensiveness, and educate myself in order to be the most effective, and you see the long list there, person I can be in your life. I hope you will always feel entitled to let me know if my blind, tough, or blank spots ever cause you to feel anything less than respected, included, and well served by me. I promise to always do my best to receive your notice of my mistakes with humility and gratitude. The upshot you know, of all of this is a movement in the way that we, at least in this country, have been dealing with diversity. The, uh, the poem up top there is one of my favorites. They drew a circle that shut me out heretic rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took them in. And again, DEI is about helping people to get along, which means that when circles are drawn narrowly, we should find a way to expand them. So the movement from left to right, you know, when people started to get beyond their tribes and bump into others, there was an us and there was a them. And there was a sense of singularity. We are singularly us and therefore probably better than those other people. They are singularly them and we need to stay away from them. And inequity is not just fine, it's natural. And then we start to move towards this thing we call diversity. And too many models of diversity look like putting the us and them in a circle, but not connecting them. So we might have diversity, two different types of beings, uh, but they are separated and inequity again either exists accidentally or it's actually justified. And then finally, you know, and I just took the letters from all these things and jumbled them together. You know, when we get to the point where people can be themselves, but also find what they have in common with others, then we truly have diversity because we're working towards equity and we're pushing for inclusion. You know, so again, this is what it comes down to for me. And for this, you know, talk that we're having, I didn't want to do a whole lot of lecturing, but I hope that in a nutshell, you know, that provides not just the what it is we're trying to do, the why it is we're trying to do it, but also some ways that actually work. So I'll pause there. Thank you. I mean, I, and I think that that approach seems so. I mean, when we're talking about buy-in, and we're one of the things that creates that ceiling effect of like, you know, people not wanting to be motivated is that sense of divisiveness. And so the way that you're talking about it, Carlos. Uh, bringing people into the circle, we're not just, you know, we're not just trying to separate victims from oppressors or something like that, but we're really talking about everyone having blind spots. And and I, you know, when you were reading through those, uh, th that list of I have blind spots, I have tough spots, to me, that that relates to like everything in life, even just not even just di the idea of diversity, but blind spots in my communication style, blind spots in my relational style, like all kinds of things that it relates to. So I think that's super helpful. Yeah, Sheena? Yeah, so um, as Carlos was talking, and as you asked the question, I immediately thought of my time at um, 
at a fitness center where I was a general manager and I had a team of just under 100 team members. And the primary way that I inspired my team members to do um, really what I wanted them to do as the leader of the, the, the space um, was I had to identify and figure out what their whys were. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you were a personal trainer, or if you were on the sales team, or if you were in the service team, or if you're on facilities, whatever your role was, I had to, to, to know and help my leaders who are, who worked, um, under me, I hate saying it that way, but, you know, I had leaders of each department, um, help them identify your why, because if you know your team members, why, then you can, can help them connect their why with that of whatever initiative, whatever change, right? And, and that will be the motivation. I think one mistake that some people make is um, presuming a team member's why in, in some ways. And then a lot of times the presumption is that the why is money or something like that people are monetarily driven. But we know through um, various studies that people's why is very all across the board, right? And um, at the more that we can connect the workplaces why to the, the individuals why, um, then the better the outcomes for everyone, right? The, the, the person is, is a happier and more productive person, which then makes the, the culture at the workplace more happy and productive, which then benefits the top line, which business leaders are generally, um, interested in, right? And so it strikes me that with the DEI stuff and the framing issue that we were talking about earlier, that part of the process that's consistently missing is this buy-in into the DEI work in the first place. And I think the primary starting point then is recognizing everyone's why, as well as making clear that the why of the organization is not just to check a box, because as soon as that's apparent to team members, um, they are going to feel um, some dissonance and some dis connection from the process in the first place if they feel that it is just a, a matter of checking the box. Um, and so the leadership really has to start with their with identifying their own whys and coming up with a sort of shared vision and mission together and then understanding that that motivation at the top level can help um, the other the other people in the organization to identify their own um, mission and vision to create a sort of shared mission and vision to like, this is why we're doing this specific DEI work. This is how I benefit from it because as human beings, a lot of us are tend to be self-motivating uh, or motivated by our own wants and desires, if you will. Um, so once we can see how this is benefiting me, right? And then how is this benefiting all of us as a team and how is this benefiting the mission and vision of the organization? Um, and if we can unlock that for more organizations, then we can unlock the true power and access the true power of what DEI done well can look like and achieve. Greg, before you jump in, I just want to add something to the whys and this actually refers to something you said earlier. You made the, you know, the, the nice point of that, you know, diversity and we've all sort of made connected these dots, you know, bring, brings wonderful things, but also, you know, the risk of, uh, fractiousness, you know, because birds of a feather will tend to flock together, et cetera. So we've been talking a little bit about giving folks a chance to register their whys, like what should motivate you, et cetera. In addition to that, I think it's important for responsible organizations of all sorts to say, you know, there's a why beyond whatever you might think is a why. You know, we live in a society that is more and more diverse and people get hurt as a result of diversity not being managed well, as Greg said earlier. You know, so sometimes there can be a resistance to the idea that there's a need for this at all. You know, if that's coming out of um, some, I don't know, admirable ignorance, you know, or apprehension because I'm nervous about this, that's one thing. If it's a denial, you know, of the fact that people who are um, adversely racialized or gendered or whatever are suffering in this world and we as a community want to make sure that we don't bring that in on the soles of our feet because we're part of this world um, if we're missing that then i think we're missing what is the major reason to do this 
it would be, you know, akin to someone saying, well, why do we have to do anti-harassment training? You know, people here would never do that. <laughs> you know, but the answer is because we're human beings and human beings are susceptible to doing uh, some things we ought not to do to each other. So we're going to train against that. You know, we're going to anticipate and make sure that in our little island, in our community, we're ready for that. And I think the same thing has to be understood around the sort of vulnerabilities that people have related to social identity and social bias. So it's kind of like a two, it's almost like a two pronged approach where we're saying, let's connect individual wise and maybe we're going to try to get to these, these goals or solve some of these problems that you all have identified. But then there's also these, these other whys, these other reasons to do this that you might not be aware of. And we need to connect those two things and make it both, uh, you know, responsive to the things we want, but also preventative and proactive to the things that we don't want that might be coming from systems. And getting back to the business bottom line that Sheena mentioned, you know, because if we have to spend a whole lot of time litigating with each other because somebody feels hurt, that's yeah. going to cost us. And it is proven, like we're going to have better product, whatever our product is, if we can get more input from diverse perspectives. So there are all sorts of whys that should be feeding this work. The mm -hmm. question is, how do we do the work well? Sorry, Greg, I made you wait. No problem at all. Um, you know, on the subject of why, um, I'd like to reference, you know, I mentioned R. Roosevelt Thomas, the late R. Roosevelt Thomas, no relation to me, but there is a living scholar who is, um, whose work is very important in this space. His name is um, Scott E. Page. Um, and he has a book here, The Diversity Bonus, how great teams pay off in the knowledge economy. I don't know if you can mm. see that clearly, but I just wanna read very quickly in terms of whys. It says the three justifications for diversity and inclusion differ. Normative arguments for diversity and inclusion policies seek to redress past wrongs or create a more equitable future. The demographic argument frames greater workforce diversity as a necessary market response. The world's diverse, we better get more diverse. And the diversity bonus logic shows that cognitively diverse teams perform better on complex tasks. Mm. So I wanna leave that, that thought with you. I mean, we have not only in organizations in our world, a series of wicked complex problems. And if we have what he calls cognitive diversity, different ways of attacking or approaching or you know, trying to confront problems in organizations and out, it's a positive. You're not gonna be able to confront, confront complex problems through just one framework. Whatever that framework is, there has to be a mixture and, 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 a, and a way to put together different voices and styles and approaches as we try to solve complex problems and, and do it through complex tasks. So I just wanted to leave that, that note also that there's work that's been done on this empirical work. And yeah. um, that book by Scott Page is, is a good one to check out. Yeah, you know, in addition to the, to the empirical work, I mean, it's just such an intuitive concept that like hmm. complex, we should have multiple ways of like thinking about this and we need multiple types of people with multiple types of backgrounds and experiences, et cetera, to weigh in. It's such an intuitive idea. Um, I wanna connect something to something that you, you talk about, Sheena. Is it important for us to not make an assumption about cognitive diversity correlating with social or demographic diversity. So in other words, is it important for us to remember that just because you are this race or this gender or this age or, it's, or et cetera, go down the list of different social identities, that we can't assume that you're automatically also cognitively diverse or you've had particular experiences that are different from this or from that? Oh, 100%. <laughs> it goes back to this idea of, of um, the benefit of not doing any particular thing for, to just check a box, right? Mm -hmm. um, socially, I check a lot of boxes, but that tells you almost nothing about who I am, how I am, how I think, what I think, you know, what I like, um, what I don't like. And there's a way in which um, 
the various labels that people can attach to their social identities um, can be misleading and can, in, in some ways, the labels reflect a certain type of diversity, but it it also, I think, can obscure other types of diversity, which I think are equally and sometimes um, maybe even more important. I can't tell you how many times I've been, you know, expected to think a particular way um, just because I checked the box of black or because I checked the box, the L in the LGBTQ plus, et cetera. Um, I think it's a misstep to make presumptions about people based on their the, the labels and, and how they identify and that that is part of what comes out of well done DEI work that we're talking about, right? Once you help people um, step outside of themselves to understand on a deep and fundamental level the history of some of these identifications, the um, the contemporary ways in which these identifications are harmful, as as Carlos was saying, um, um, and and what these identifications don't correlate to, right? Namely, like intellectual diversity, right? Um, then we can start to get somewhere, right? Because then we're actually required to do the, what I would say, the fun work and the good work of really getting to know each other. Um, and once we can know each other, then we can know who each other is um, outside of and beyond, it, but, and also including the, the identifications. Oh, oh you're Carlos, muted, you're Carlos. Muted. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'll do a, a both and or a yes and, uh, you know, as Greg would say, and say, yes, I completely agree that we ought not to presume that somebody's quote unquote identity, you know, means that they think, act, feel, behave a certain way. Um, that would be essentializing people. Um, but one of the tricky things, I think, and important things about when, when we talk about social identity is we ought not to be talking about essential qualities. We're talking about circumstance and socialization. And, you know, when looked at that way, it is fair to say, and I'll say it about my male socialized identity, it would be fair, you know, for someone to assume that, well, if Carlos Hoyt was socialized in a male way in this society, he might be susceptible, you know, to some sexist uh, thoughts, uh, and hopefully he's worked really hard, you know, to push against that. And I hope that I have, you'll have to ask the people in my life, I guess. Um, so that both end, I think, is very important, because if we turn our backs on the second one, we're missing opportunities you know, to steer down some problems that just come with how we were socialized and how we were raised. One of the things I'd like to invite people to do is actually examine what I call their cycle of socialization. You know, What is the ethos that you were born into like before you even came into this world? You know, What's the culture you, or cultures you were about to step into? How did that culture inform you, you know, as you moved around through your cycle? When did you get to the point where you realized there are other ways to be in this world? And then what did you do with that? Did you perpetuate everything that was uploaded into you? Did you modify it a little bit? Did you reject some things? So if we can shift from, you know, essentializing and reducing people to corporeal identities, and instead, you know, really focus on all of us were socialized one way or the other, what do we do with that socialization in order to make for a better world? Then I think we're onto something. And, I, and the only thing I'll add is, you know, there is some diversity of viewpoint that does come from circumstances, right? Because I grew up on a farm, you know, or somewhere else, like that may have impacted how I see the world, and that might be a wonderful thing, you know. So let's account for that as well. Yeah, I, w I wonder um, if we, if we're, if it, it, it reminds me of something. So I, I was talking to a client um, that we were doing some consulting with, and it reminds me of this check the box situation. So, so they were saying basically like, yeah, we want diverse, we want to hire, we want to make sure we're sort of like X percentage of this and X percentage of that, you know, um, but, but as long as there's no Republicans or something like that, right? So it's like that now, and I, and I think of another organization right now that I, that I work with that there's, you know, and, and I think this is kind of common these days is um, at, at least in some of the organizations that we work with is someone who is more conservative is very afraid to speak up, for instance. And um, these companies, if they have these sort of initiatives with diversity, 
and there's a, a certain group of people that are, you know, that are really afraid to speak up because um, their ideas may not be popular in, you know, in, in our society or something or in their particular organization. What is there anything that we can do or, or, or any guidance or advice you would give um, company management if they're really, if, if we discover that and if they're, if they're wanting to invite more of these kind of voices, different types of voices, but they're also kind of scared to invite them because they don't know what it would cause or how, you know, if it would cause a lot of uh, conflict in the organization. Well, I, I, one thing I think is, you know, the question is the relevance what is the relevance of someone's, uh, in this case, political perspective mm. to our mission, to the work that we do, to the work of the organization? I mean, I, I think that has to be looked at um, also. But one of the fundamental things I think that goes beyond certain differences, I mean, this is, this is both, we share this ultimate difference um, which is kind of a, a play on the thought. Each of us are unique individuals. Each of us has a unique fingerprint, which is indicative of our uniqueness. So whatever the company, pro for-profit, non-profit, if you have a group of people, look at them as individuals, mm. okay? I think that's a very important foundation. Then we layer on, you know, various identities, various groupings, you know, and you take in consideration what's important to them, sure. But if you start off with working with them as individuals, you're not bringing certain, or at least ideally, you're not bringing certain assumptions to the table. And because they are an individual, they have had unique experiences. Um, and we are each, since we're each unique, we share that uniqueness. So that's something we, we share in common. That's what I meant, kind of a paradoxical idea. So I really think that's, that's important to state um, because I think very oftentimes the very individuality of people uh, may not be acknowledged enough in these spaces or that's part of why some of the tensions and some of the problems are there because people automatically are placed into a particular grouping because of external appearance, uh, because of how they've been socialized. Um, and then people start off there. I think a fundamental premise is, you know, the uniqueness of each individual. I think that's a, a very important place to be, or at least a starting point and something to acknowledge um, in many yeah. dimensions, not just, not just in DEI. Gina, well, real yeah. fast. I just noticed the time. I totally forgot that we we're actually oh, supposed to be at two thirty. I thought we were. I thought we had till two forty. But we have till two thirty. Um, can we wrap? Can we? Do you want to? That's my wanna last statement. Final? I'll, I'll, okay, I'll that, let that yeah, be great my last, last statement. statement. <laughs> that was a great. You want to just give like a quick sixty second? Uh, sure. Sixty second. Wrap up? Yeah. Sure. So I, I just wanted to emphasize what Greg said. Because I think part of what came through to me, Jeremy, when you were talking about the specific example of like politics, is that the presumption is then that if you are a Republican or if you are a conservative, that you think a certain way. And again, it goes back to the fundamental issue of essentialization that we fall into the trap of and the pitfalls of just coming along with a particular label. Because I can tell you from my own experience that um, I know plenty of people who do not check the box of Republican who are afraid to speak or share their ideas and how they think because they are demonized and because they are expected to think a different way because they check this race box or they check that gender box. Mm -hmm. And so again, it, it comes back to the necessity of humanizing um, ourselves first and foremost. And part of that humanizing process fundamentally requires people to be viewed as individuals first. And then we can do the analytical analytical work of the the social identifications and 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 the problems that come along with those social identifications such a good point thank and you actually, and i'm pushing you myself know. on a timer so i don't go past a minute um okay and i want to actually address the question you raised jeremy because that is the rubber hits the road question you know so we do this work we believe in inclusivity like where do we draw the line 
you know, when someone says you need to be inclusive of what I think, not who I am, <laughs> you know, so let's move away from Republican or labels and actually talk about what might be something that I present that isn't allowed here, right? Mm -hmm. And we can imagine at the extremes what those things are. If we have an anti-discrimination policy, then someone who is a flagrant bigot, that's a problem, right? If we are taking care of children in our school, you know, and we have a parent who practices pretty severe corporal punishment, that's a problem. Like the law doesn't like that. And now we move away from the extremes to something that's, you know, a bit more vague, maybe. If I've just hired somebody who's uh, an election denier from the last election, how's that going to play out in our milieu? Like, we need, like, can we talk about that? You know, and we just need to figure out, like, how do we manage differences when they do uh, um, arise? So I'll stop there, but I'm glad you took us, you know, right down to the road because that's when it gets tricky. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we could we could talk about this for another two hours. I mean, this time flies, and where this is this is a, such an interesting discussion, and 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 I think I think very helpful. And I really appreciate uh, all three of you being here and, and participating in our summit and participating in this important talk. So, thank you so much. Sorry to 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 cut it like feelingly early, but it's uh, <laughs> so thanks thanks again. I'm going to stop recording.